Good morning. If you will take your seats, we'll begin our program. I always have the unenviable task of having people quiet down. So first of all, let me say welcome back to campus. My name is Mike Hutchison. I'm the Vice President uh, of Institutional Advancement. And uh, certainly on behalf of President Harper, who is with us today, I want to welcome you um, on behalf of her office, uh, also on behalf of our faculty and staff that have had a tremendous impact, I know, on many in this room. For many of you, this is a return trip. And if it's been a while since you've been here, you will notice the campus has changed a little bit, right? As we sit in the most iconic building on campus, Radford Auditorium, and as you look across the campus, we of course see Old Main, the most historic building on campus. And between the two of them sits the new jewel of the campus, our new Garrison United Methodist Campus Center, which will be complete, fingers crossed, in December. So we look forward to uh, showing off that new facility uh, in the spring semester. We also have, if you have not noticed, on the south part of campus by the Swaggery Tennis Center, we also have new apartments going on. The good news with that is our dorms are overflowing, and so we're moving our students, some of our students, juniors and seniors, over to some new apartments as well. So I hope as alumni and friends of the institution, um, you appreciate that progress. And the university has really undergone many changes over the past 100 years, and the people in our history have made a significant impact on who we are and how we've evolved. They have given us a unique identity, they've defined us and made it possible for us to be able to celebrate our centennial, but not only celebrate it, but celebrate it with pride. Without knowledge of our past, we cannot fully appreciate where we are, and so it is my privilege to introduce you to a local celebrity, and I do mean celebrity, and foremost authority on Abilene's history, Jay Moore, who will take us back to our humble beginnings and walk us through the decades to our centennial celebration. Jay has authored Abilene History in Plain Sight, Abilene Stories from Then to Now, and Abilene A to Z. He has produced a documentary film titled History in Plain Sight, focusing on Abilene's history. Jay's educational and highly entertaining presentations at the Paramount Theater consistently draw packed crowds. And we are fortunate to have him here today and to share little known facts about interesting events and people behind the scenes of McMur McMurray's historical annals. Now it is my pleasure to invite to the podium our friend Jay Moore for his presentation, Some McMurray Days. Let's give him a hearty welcome. Thank y'all. I've never been more acutely aware than I am right now that I graduated from a different local college than McMurray. Um, barely, a week before graduation, the registrar called me into her office and told me that I was short of chapel credits. And I said, what is this chapel of which you speak? <laughs> I thought that would sound more educated. Um, anyway, I had to write a book report in order to wash away that transgression, and uh, I'm, I'm not bragging here, but I wrote the book report without chat GPT. Uh, I used nothing but my own artificial intelligence to create that, so. But I can't believe McMurray is 100. I drive by here all the time. I thought y'all were about 60, 65. That's how, how you look to me right there. I certainly didn't think you were 100. I mean, if you just look, your, your trees are green, your buildings are strong, you got good trees, it's, everything's going on there, but you have a lot to celebrate, and you've, uh, you should celebrate that. Um, <laughs> on the left up there is, uh, that's your longtime dean and later vice president, Bill McDaniel, along with uh, Dr. George Steinman, who taught religion here for so long. They're actually celebrating, in 1963, the 40th anniversary of McMurray. I don't know, well, I have to assume there were other activities besides this horn blowing <laughs> that they had 
Um, but there is much to celebrate today, and you know that, not the least of which is a record enrollment at McMurray University. <laughs> Congratulations and well done. So anyway, uh, here you are, 100 years in. Um, and I know that is not a current campus photo, but I am a historian, so all of the pictures will be out of date today. Um, just like when I was at the other university and forgot to go to chapel, I know you all have chapel here too, and sometimes, um, I'm not sure how adamant you are about people showing up, but sometimes they combine chapel with revivals. Uh, this is from a 1927 edition of the school paper here. It says, every year there's a tendency on the part of some of the students to cut these services because they become bored or because they're afraid someone will speak to them regarding the welfare of their souls. <laughs> Becoming bored is no longer a problem because they're too busy crushing candy and breaking bubbles out there to do anything else. But don't get nervous. I'm not gonna talk to you about the wel welfare of your soul. I hope to just uh, visit with you about some McMurray days. Unfortunately, it is impossible to cover 100 years in the time that I have been um, given. Fortunately, 100 years is a long time ago. None of you are here, and I can make up pretty much whatever I want to about that. But when McMurray was 10, uh, there were 12 buildings on campus, and they were over overflowing as they are today with students, and there was a new library on the drawing board, and according to that headline, you were searching for some new goals. To cap off your 25th, you claimed your very first conference football title by beating Southwestern 34 to 14. At the 50th anniversary, you celebrated by opening the brand new J.W. Hunt Center of Physical Education. Uh, when you were 70, you got your first computer. <laughs> Just look at that relic. Um, <laughs> Joe Specht has been here 48 of the 100 years. That's impressive uh, that he has done that. When you reach 75, you put out some banners, um, but you also launched a $20 million campaign. And I've got to be honest, uh, I don't think you had the most innovative slogan for the campaign because it was called Campaign for McMurray. But now, with 100 years, uh, and with an expanded and a renovated and a much improved, soon to open campus center, um, you have a lot to celebrate. And not only that, but look at that picture. Look how skinny everybody is in that picture right there. Some of you, though, were here 50 years ago, and you might recall things when it looked like this. You might remember when the athletics annex was still a Burger Chef. I miss Burger Chef. But today, by the thousands, each day, Abilenians drive down South 14th, they drive down Sales, they pass the corner with Wawa Tacy Park on it, and it, this campus is definitely part of the DNA of Abilene, Texas. So in the time I have up here, I'd just like to recall a smattering of those moments. It was in March of 1920 when the fate of a proposed Methodist college was up in the air. Abilene, of course, was vying to be the home of that new college, but so was Stanford. And actually, Stanford was just looking to reclaim their old college because for 11 years, from 1907 to 1918, a Methodist school in Stanford, which was known as Stanford College, and as you can tell, they had a very cute basketball team. In 1911, that team traveled to Fort Worth to play a local YMCA team. And with eight minutes left in the game, they decided that the ref was biased and that they would refuse to finish the game. I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that they were losing 14 to 39 at the time. <laughs> and by the way, I don't think that 14 on the basketball refers to their score. I think it was the year that the picture was taken. But the Stanford College had an impressive campus. They had this four-story citadel there. And of course, the school's president, at least for the last two years, was the former pastor of St. Paul Church here in Abilene, Reverend James Winfred Hunt. But it was a fire in April of 1918 that set in motion the chain of events that caused the school to close and for McMurray to be here today. And with no school to lead, Dr. Hunt returned to Abilene and returned to St. Paul Church, and he began urging for a new school, this time in his uh, reclaimed hometown, and it was an idea that soon gained traction. So in March of 1920, there was a key meeting that took place at first First Methodist Church here, and that is how First Methodist looked in 1920. Um, the meeting was, you're gonna have to get ready for this, the meeting was of 
the educational board of the Northwest Conference of Texas of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. That did not fit on their name tags, I don't think, that day. But they were there to consider uh, bids from towns looking to be the home of a new college, but there were only two towns in the running, Abilene and Stanford. And Abilene was up to bat first. Abilene offered $200,000 in cold, hard cash from the local Methodist. They offered another $100,000 backed by the full faith and credit of the Chamber of Commerce. And further, we offered up a 32 square acres in South Abilene. It was valued at $50,000. The city pledged to extend the trolley car line from South 7th down Grand Avenue, and the streets around the campus would be paved and lit with electric lights. And in a moment of hasty fervor, our mayor, Mayor Scarborough, said that the college could have free water in perpetuity. <laughs> Later, we realized just how much water that came to and said it was a joke. We were kidding about that. <laughs> we also might have let slip that the school might be named for the Methodist Bishop McMurray. Wink, wink on that. So Stanford was up next, and basically they offered up the partially burned out shell of the former school. So... The committee opted for Abilene. Um, Stanford appealed, but as you know, the appeal was not successful. And by the way, in 1949, the board of McMurray uh, voted to recognize all former graduates of Stanford College as ex-students of McMurray, because that is a good way to build your donor base right there. <laughs> in April of 21, a name was chosen. It reads, the name of the new Methodist College to be located here has been chosen, McMurray College. They have misspelled that since day one, haven't they? <laughs> Often the Abilene paper simply put an apostrophe in place of the C, which I'm pretty sure did not save that much ink for the paper. <laughs> Dr. Hunt would leave his position at St. Paul and he would assume the presidency of the college that he had dreamt of and under his direction, uh, the planning for a campus began. It was Bishop William McMurray who came here, of course, being the college namesake, and he was here in September of 21 to ceremonial turn, ceremonially turn the dirt on the new campus. This is the original grand campus plan that they envisioned. The circular drive is where the trolley cars would make their turn around. The main entrance was to be off of South 14th with the drive leading right up to Old Main, and that street was to line up with Highland Avenue, but somehow it didn't line up with Highland Avenue. Of course, you can still see that original drive today, but if you try to turn there, you're going to bounce over the curb, so that's going to be hard on your car. But the grand plan started much smaller. There were just two structures, an administration building and four tennis courts. <laughs> and both of those are still here. <laughs> so Old Main, which surely was known as Young Main at the time, began to rise in South Abilene. That's an odd angle for that picture, but the shorter part at the back is the auditorium there. But it stood ready for class by the late summer of 1923, and Dr. Hunt took up his desk. Very soon after that, a girl's dorm went up. It was built where today the band hall stands, which was very handy to the tennis courts. Um, as you know, no name rises higher in the pantheon of McMurray University than Dr. Hunt. Not only was he the school's president for the first 11 years, that first dorm bore his name, just as today it uh, graces the physical education building and a replacement Hunt Hall, and it also is the name of the street bordering one side of the campus. For those who had, were inquiring about attending McMurray, they were sent the bulletin, and among other things, it touted the Abilene climate. It said the climate is most wonderful. A gentle breeze is continuous, giving days just right for study and play and nights cool and delightful for rest and sleep. <laughs> then they added this caveat, where it is at all possible students should arrive at Abilene during the daytime. <laughs> McMurray officially opened on a Thursday. It was September the 20th, 1923. There's Dr. Hunt. They have just stood to sing the song America. And with the crowd settled, Dr. Hunt then rose to get things started. And the very first word that he ever spoke, the first word of the official school of McMurray, he said, now, as in now, ladies and gentlemen, now at the start, now we begin, now let's get going. He was ready to move forward. The auditorium that day in Old Main was filled to capacity. They brought in extra chairs. Uh, they were all there to see McMurray set in a chivalrous show of support, the student body 
uh, prior to the start of the program, they led a yell for McMurray, but they also led a yell for Hardin Simmons and one for Abilene Christian. The mayor at the time, Charles Coombe, welcomed the college, followed by the Hardin Simmons president who offered a welcome to the club speech. And then Methodist elder W.M. Lane stood and he read from Proverbs chapter three. He read, happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. Uh, that day, the administration boasted that 200 students had enrolled in McMurray. It actually was 185, but who's counting? So um, the student newspaper was available, and it carried this anonymous poem titled, Going to McMurray. I've washed my overalls and patched my old brogans and trimmed my fingernails and soaped and scrubbed my hands. I'm freckled-faced and Roman-nosed, and I'll admit I'm green, but I'm going to that college they have built in Abilene. The initial student handbook was dispensed to the students and it too contained some advice and some edicts for success on campus and frankly they were all over the map. First it reminded you that gossiping is cowardly. Uh, chapel is not a social function <coughs> because they will be discussing the welfare of your soul there. Also the contents of the bulletin board are to be read. That is the 1920s equivalent of check your email. And then this. When watching tennis games, don't forget and walk across the court, thereby delaying someone's play. You'd be surprised to know how many actually do this very thing. It is either pure laziness or a reflection of their home training. <laughs> That's the most specific slice of college life to focus in on that I can possibly imagine. You did have the courts though. The student handbook also outlined grading at McMurray. There were seven levels. You could get an E, which was between 59 and 50. F was below a 50, but you could also get a G, which was essentially their way. <laughs> that was their way of saying maybe college isn't for you. McMurray wasted no time in fielding a football team, the 1923 squad led by Coach Medley. They were a handsome bunch. They were only 22, so no one needed to get hurt. I also noticed on the front row, we got three socks that are missing. I don't know if that was an early budget cutback or not. <laughs> After two issues, the bulletin changed its name to the War Whoop, and the headline reported that McMurray had dropped its first football game to Breckenridge 12 to six, but that was all set by the opposite headline that they had won their first home game the following week when they downed Thorpe Springs 25 to nothing. And during that game, which by the way was ankle deep in mud, one of the referees was a guy from Canyon, Texas named Pete Shotwell, who later would become the McMurray Athletic Director in 1956. Next you defeated Saul Ross, but then you fell to the Lutherans of Clifton College. Also on the front page was the, school, was the news that the school's second building was ready. It was 10 feet by 12 feet and only had a roof. It was a bus stop and a trolley stop. And I wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. Barely into the second semester, a scandal cropped up. At 4.15 on the afternoon of Sunday, February the 1st, 1925, a freshman girl eloped. She was Imogene Francis. She also was the society editor for the newspaper and she left out the back door of Punt Hall to marry her high school sweetheart, Carl Nance of Ballinger. Carl had driven up around 1.30 and called for Imogene and she was allowed to go outside and speak to him just briefly but then she was called back in because it was quiet hour in the dorm and she couldn't have guests until four. So Carl returned at four she threw a few things in the bag and she signaled to Carl to drive around back and she bolted out the rear door. They sped off to Ballinger and became husband and wife. The school newspaper reported that all of Hunt Hall was left in a daze. <laughs> and the war whoop was short an editor and the student body was down to 184. By the way, they were married for 46 years before Carl passed away in 1970. Some other things they said you might want to remember. No portable phonographs were allowed in the dormitories. Never hiss or boo the decision of the referee. The chances are he is right, you are wrong. <laughs> and the mail line is not the place for a visit with your friends, nor a time for shoving and scuffling. 
I suspect there was an earlier incident in the mail line that caused for that to be put in there. By 1928, there was a problem here that needed addressing. It seems the incoming freshmen were woefully behind in their studies, particularly in grammar and spelling. There were 95 freshmen and only 12 passed the English placement test. So, of course, English 119 was offered to help. And by the way, most of the freshmen were for Abilene High and 30% of those needed help. You may know I taught at Abilene High. I was not there in 1928, nor did I teach English. So McMurray was underway. And I, I, you know, I find it comforting to think that that building has been standing right there for 100 years. And for all those who came before us, they saw the same sight that we do today. I looked through a lot of your yearbooks. And you'd be surprised how often people get into those urns by the front door. <laughs> I don't know if that's a tradition, but you should start that as one, I think. These girls were members of an all-girl club known as UTD. And sporting those flapper heritage, you know they were a handful. One of the girls was an assistant in the library. And when a young man came in and he asked for a particularly popular title at the time, he said, do you have freckles? She said, no, silly, not this time of year. Anybody, anyway, nobody knew what UTD stood for, and they weren't telling. Some people speculated it meant unsweetened tea drinkers or unmercifully tantalizing damsels, which, as you can see, that they were. The coquettish girl there in the middle, her name was Tittles McGinty. And with a name like Tittles, is there any doubt that they would push the boundaries of things? In 1925, they went downtown to Mr. Robinson's photo studio to have their club picture made for the yearbook. And... Um, if there's young children here, you might want to cover their ears and their eyes because I'm about to show you the picture. Uh, it was very startling because they wore pants. <laughs> and that ensuing uproar could be heard clear down to First Methodist Church. The school brass was offended. They forced the yearbook to leave the picture out, and the editor put in instead a box that said the great open space, and he explained exactly why the picture was no longer there. So Tittles McGinty and the pants-wearing UTD club were forced underground. A new club popped up. They were known as the Triple D Club. They took their yearbook, not only wearing pants, but wearing men's ties and mischievous grins. <laughs> and they never told what the Ds stood for. Of course, McMurray did not just fill the football squad. There was a baseball team as well, and one of the most outstanding pitchers was a fellow named Pat Murphy, and he was smart. He was smart enough to know that his fastballs did not work. So he perfected his curveballs, and it was in a game against East Texas State that he let off as a fastball. It got knocked over the fence. So he resorted to his tried and true, the curveball, to stymie those East Texas batters, and soon McMurray had taken the lead. The coach for East Texas, though, began to notice that each time before Pat made a pitch, he reached into his hip pocket, and he thought, aha, that's why the curveballs are so good. He's putting something on the ball, so he marched out to the umpire, and demanded that the game come to a halt, and Murphy was called over. He proclaimed his innocence. Uh, the umpire said, let me see what's in your back pocket, and he sheepishly took out his rabbit foot. <laughs> Female students living in college halls were subject to certain rules. They were governed by your classification. Freshman ladies were allowed two weekend dates a month, However, if the date was off campus, the couple had to be accompanied by a chaperone unless the outing involved two or more couples. Sophomore girls were allowed two weekend dates a month with the added bonus of one weeknight date. Juniors earned weekend date time plus two extra nights Monday through Friday. The bookkeeping on this was a nightmare, I feel quite certain. <laughs> But in a stroke of retention genius, the senior girls, age, uh, anyone over age 20, were allowed discretionary privileges. In other words, you could date to your heart's content. But regardless of classification, any failure to report to the dorm hostess within 15 minutes after a night ball game was put down as a date. And should you wish to see a non-McMurray lad, your parents had to write the dorm hostess advising that everything was on the up and up for that. For years, the most popular place to loiter was the bookstore, and in between classes, everyone went to the bookstore because I believe they loud shoving and scuffling at the bookstore. <laughs> you could not only buy your books there, you could eat there. And in their ads, they touted that they had an electric toaster, which could not only toast your bread, but also heat up your sandwich. By 1928, the bookstore had to be expanded. 
you could get everything it said from a safety pin to a volume of Shakespeare there, but the real draw was romance and the chance to court a co-ed. It also served as the headquarters for hatching pranks. It was a group of McMurray boys who spirited away the very sentimental Hardin Simmons Canyon in Cannon in the 1930s and threw out the greatest red herring of all time and made it look like the band from Texas Tech who was in town had actually pulled off a prank. We should read about that sometime. And then prior to a 1940 football game against uh, Abilene Christian, the McMurray boys delivered a dozen stray dogs to the ACC campus, <laughs> which confused ACC as much as it did the dogs. <laughs> Twelve years after building the tennis courts, you finally fielded a tennis team. I don't know what took so long. One of those selected as a McMurray 100 uh, was this alum and later an Abilene building contractor, C.B. Oates. Of course, his buildings were seen all across campus. He built the Gold Star Hall. He built the Dining Hall. He built the Administration Building. He built the Science Building. And he also built the current St. Paul Church downtown where he was a member. Uh, and he went to church with Katie Frame. And she, uh, they knew each other quite well. She actually worked at McMurray. And she was the widow of the longtime school birther OP train. Um, their house was just down the street here on Sales. One day, Mr. Oates was at the light at South 14th in Sales, and the car in front of his truck had, was too far into the intersection, so she put it in reverse and backed up, and it was Katie Train. She was oblivious to the fact that she had hit his truck, and even more oblivious to the fact that her bumper had locked on to his bumper. <laughs> and when the light changed, she dragged him six blocks to her house <laughs> on Sales. And she pulled into her driveway with him stuck fast behind. <laughs> and she got out, and she was giving him an earful, demanding to know why he was following her so closely. <laughs> and all I can say is he was very Christian about the whole thing. <laughs> Tradition held that should McMurray freshmen successfully fly their class flag on campus for at least 24 hours, that any restrictions imposed by upperclassmen would be lifted. And the main restriction was they could not walk on the grass. They had to stay on the sidewalk. Also, the flag had to be at least two foot square, had to be green and white. So, in October of 1950, when upperclassmen saw the freshman flag fluttering from a 220 volt electrical wire connected to a stadium light pole, they had to take action. There were just six hours left before the 24 hours had elapsed. So Sweetwater Junior Bob Brookshire volunteered to bring the flag down and deny them their campus freedom. They turned off the electricity, and Brookshire donned his pole climbing spikes and a safety belt, and he managed to reach the top of the 100-foot pole. The flag was about 10 feet away from the pole, so he used his safety belt to slide along the wire out to it, and he unceremoniously detached it and victoriously dropped it to the ground below. The triumphant Brookshire now began to inch his way back to the pole, but he found it impossible to close the gap because his weight was causing the wire to sag, and he could not execute his exit strategy to get back to the pole. He hung there for nearly 30 minutes before the fire department arrived. <laughs> <laughs> when they got him down, Bob got a pretty stern talking to from the fireman in charge. It seemed the freshman had paid an electrician $7.50 to put that flag up there. Over the span of McMurray days, students have had the chance to see the world. That's the Chanters on a trip to London, and later the band went there too. Uh, here's Kai Omicron on a field trip out to Impact, Texas. <laughs> Each young man will change his sheets at least once a week. Throwing matches and cigarettes on the floor is prohibited. Also, you could earn demerits, and for a minor offense, you got one demerit. Some of the minor offenses were this, running water after 11 p.m. With free water, I don't know why that was such a problem, but <laughs> ironing during study hours, uh, is no, you could get a demerit for that, and also not being completely dressed on the first floor. Five years after the fire department rescued Bob Brookshire, the freshmen successfully flew their flag for 24 hours and got to walk on the grass in 1955. Another auspicious day was September 4th, 1990, when McMurray College became McMurray University. 
Uh, how many times have you all driven past this building, Radford Auditorium? It is a campus icon, Mike, and the building's history began on a March day in 1947 when it was announced that Bessie Radford was donating $350,000 for the construction of a student life center. She soon added an additional $300,000 to that original gift and she gave it as a memorial gift of her husband, Jim Radford, who has been in the hotel grocery business here in Abilene. In May of 1949, just prior to commencement, uh, Mrs. Radford was awarded an honorary doctorate and then she pulled the lever and sent the very first batch of concrete into this building's uh, foundation. Uh, the school's foundation was planted a century ago, thousands of days ago, thousands of students ago, thousands of faculty members, administrators, donors, fans, and people like you who have poured into this foundation that McMurray is still building on. And I'm gonna predict that 100 years from now, when my great-granddaughter stands here to talk to you about the 200th anniversary. One day that I think will be even more meaningful than it already has been will be what happened on October the 1st of 2013. That's 10 years and 27 days ago. So that is the day that brought Dr. Harper to the president's chair. Not only was she the first female president of McMurray, but she's the first and the only female to lead in Abilene University. And I believe it ushered in for McMurray some of the finest years that this school has ever experienced. <laughs> And uh, 100 years or 50 or 20 or five, you're gonna be even more grateful that she spent time here. But it was 100 years ago that Dr. Hunt stood on an opening day and said, now. And I like that word because now implies today, this moment, but it also um, has the full expectation that there's more to be said, that there's more to come. And I believe that right now at McMurray University, there is much, much more to follow. Congratulations on your 100 years. Jay, thank you for helping us fall in love anew with this special place. We really appreciate that. Jay mentioned that there are many who have shaped our university. Those and many more are comprised of McMurray 100. We'll tell you more about them in just a few minutes, uh, but first we want to take a brief intermission uh, to let people go to the um, other activities that we have, but we will be starting the McMurray uh, 100 in at 1030. So what we would ask you to do in the interim, if you are one of the honorees or you're representing one of the honorees, we would ask you to move forward beyond where the tape is that we have taped off, move to the front, and then you will receive instructions as to where to sit and, and how to move for the ceremony. So we have about 30 minutes, so we'll have time for a bathroom break, and we'll also have time for you to get some water. Again, Jay, thank you, and uh, the ceremony will start in about uh, 25 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 